Hi everyone, today we're going to talk about absolute maxima and absolute minima, sometimes called absolute extrema. So we're still talking about max and min like we have before, but now we're trying to find the very highest and the very lowest point for a graph. We're going to start like we have before where we have a graph and we're trying to decide does it have a max, does it have a min. So just looking at this parabola that has a vertex at 3, 0, we can see that's the minimum value. So the minimum value is 3, and that occurs when x is 0. If we look for a maximum, these points that go up to the right and up to the left say there isn't a highest point, so when it says the maximum, we can just say there is none. Okay, let's take a look at a second graph. So this graph, we can see it's coming from negative infinity, it's going up, and then it goes back down. So when we look for a minimum, we can't really see a true minimum. Over to the left and over to the right, it looks like it gets smaller, but we can't really see exactly what it is. And we could put in this line, oh, it's a terrible line, or pretend it's a line. We could put in this line, and it looks like it's going towards zero, but it doesn't look like it hit it. So for this minimum value this time, we're gonna say none. For the maximum though, we do have this point at two, so the maximum is two, and again, it occurs where x is equal to zero. This third graph kind of comes from the bottom, goes up, and just keeps going up, up, up. So because it comes from down, we don't see a smallest value. That arrow says it continues to go down. So there is no min, so we're going to say none. And then as we're looking to the right, this function is always increasing, which says there's also no max. Right, so let's look at that with some data. So this says this is the estimated aggregate revenue of the U.S. advertising, public relations, and related service industry from 2004 to 2019 in billions of U.S. dollars. So I'm breaking this down over a number of years. So the first set of years, I said, what was the highest revenue from 2004 to 2012? So I'm cutting it right here. So we're only looking from the beginning, 2004 to 2012, and I say, what was the highest revenue? So we can look through and you can see this 87.43, 87.43 was the highest. Also in that time frame of 2004 to 2012, I want to know the lowest. So you, again, you're looking very carefully through these numbers and I see the 65.93 was the lowest revenue during that time period. Now I'm going to switch the time period. Now I want to look from 2008 to 2019. So I'm gonna kind of draw a line again so we can see where I'm separating it. 2008, and I'm gonna go all the way to the right to 2019. And I said, well, what's the highest over that time period? So it looks like it's going up as we go to the right. So the highest would have been 138.61. And then underneath that, I said, well, what was the lowest revenue from 2008 to 2019? So again, scanning through those numbers, I can see this 77.43 would be the lowest. And we're going to see that over and over again in this section that we're looking at, well, what if we're specific about the time period or the interval of the domain that we're looking at? And we can see that when I said highest, I got 87.43 from 2004 to 2012. But then when I went to a different time period of 2008 to 2019, I got a different highest value. So I can do these little snapshots of the domain and get different values for the max and the min over those intervals. So we do have names for that in calculus. Let's start with absolute maxima. So absolute maxima says if f of c is greater than or equal to f of x for all x in the domain of f of x, this is supposed to be then, f of c is called the absolute maxima. So we're saying if we have a value that's larger than everything else, then it would be the maxima. Very similar to that, we kind of just flip the sign and we say if f of c is less than or equal to f of x for all x in the domain of f of x, then f of c is called the absolute min. So if something this highest, we call it the absolute max. If something is always the lowest, it's called the absolute min. The extreme value theorem says a function that is continuous on a closed interval AB has both an absolute max and an absolute min. The absolute extrema will occur at either an endpoint of the interval or a critical point in the interval. 
So what we see here is we're still doing first derivative set equal to zero that gives me a critical point. But we also have some endpoints that are of interest too. So we're going to have to decide is our max or min happening at one of the critical points or is it happening at the end point? And I think you're going to be very pleased that it's not too bad when we go to figure that out. So let's stay with our graphs for a minute before we do this the long way. So back to the graph I had earlier that was always increasing, but now I've cut it off. So what you see here is I've made this a shorter window of negative one to two. So my X starts at negative one, it stops at two. When I look at a maximum, I can see that this two eight at the top is the highest point. So my absolute maxima would be the point two eight. And my absolute minimum would be this point negative one, negative one. So it's the same graph we had earlier that went down and went up, but then I cut it, right? So since I cut it, I've created a max and a min, and these happen to both happen at the endpoints of the interval. So here's another graph that you can see has been cut. So this one, if I look at where does it start, it starts at negative three on the left and it goes over to four on the right. So I have this closed domain of negative three to four and I'm looking for a maxima and a minima. So the maximum way up at the top, negative two, 5.33 and four, 5.33. So I have two points that are maximum and that's fine. It doesn't say there's only one point that's maximum. It just says there will be a maximum. So let's write both of them, negative two, 5.333 and four, 5.333. And then the minimum, well, I can see the minimum down at the bottom. This was two, negative 5.333. Now we had an occurrence of like both things happening here. The negative two, 5.33, along with the four, 5.33. This one was a critical point. We can see it's where it changed from increasing to decreasing. And this was an end point. The minimum, was also a critical point because we can see it change from decreasing to increasing. So you do see that we're going to have to check all of them because they they could occur either place. So let's try this the normal way. Let's go back to a function and decide the max and min over some closed intervals. So we're going to start with f of x is negative 3x squared plus 12x minus 5. And for part a, we're going to find the absolute max and min over the interval 0 to 7. So I'm going to start by taking the derivative. So derivative of negative 3x squared is negative 6x. 12x becomes 12 and the 5 goes away. I need to know the critical point, so I'm going to set negative 6x plus 12 equal to 0. That says negative 6x equals negative 12. x is going to be 2. So this 2, I actually get to talk about for both a and b. This is the critical point for the function. It's not going to change when I change the intervals. But what I want to make sure is, I want to make sure 2 is in the interval. So in a, my interval is 0 to 7, and 2 is certainly there. So to decide the max and the min, I need to find f of 0, f of 7, and f of 2. So I'm just checking the endpoints and the critical points in the interval. So to do this, what am I going to do? I want to know the value of f. Notice this does not say f prime, it says f. So I'm going to plug 0, 7, and 2 into the original function. So let's do that using Desmos. So I'm going to put in f of x, this is our original function, is negative 3x squared plus 12x minus 5. And we could make a table or we can just plug the values in. So let's just plug in the values. So we need to do f of 0, f of 7, and f of 5, and f of 2. So we end up with negative 5, negative 68, and 7. So we have negative 5, negative 68, and 7. To determine the max, we look for which one's the biggest. So negative 5, negative 68, and 7. This is the biggest. This is my absolute max. And this will be at 2, 7. And then I look for what's the smallest. So between negative 5 and negative 68, negative 68 is smallest. So absolute min. This will be 7, negative 68. So we're going to repeat that for part B. Part B, we're going over the interval of negative 2 to 1. So we already know our critical point. 
right? We already know that my critical point's gonna happen at two, seven, and two, when I look at it, two is not between negative two and one, so I'm not going to use that one. So let's just kind of write that two is not in the interval. So what does that mean? It means we only have two numbers to check. We need to look at f of negative two and we need to look at f of one. So I'm gonna go back to Desmos and just quickly put um, negative two and one in. All right, so for f of negative two, I got negative 41 and for f of one, I got four. So here I have a negative 41 and I have four. Now this time I only have two answers. One will be the max, one will be the min. So the four is big. So this will be my absolute max. And this will be at one, four. And then negative two, negative 41, that will be my absolute min. So notice how much easier this is. We didn't make a chart. We didn't have to do the first derivative test. We went straight to plug the numbers in, find the biggest, find the smallest. Well, let's try that again. This time I have the function f of x is 1 3rd of x cubed plus 5 halves x squared minus 6x plus 9, and I gave us three integrals. So first 0 to 9, then negative 3 to 3, then negative 10 to 8. So before we start, let's find the derivative. So I have f prime of x is 1 3rd of x cubed becomes x squared. 5 halves of x squared becomes 5x, negative 6x, derivative is negative 6, and the 9 goes away. I set this equal to 0, so x squared plus 5x minus 6 equals 0. We want to factor that, so this will be x plus 6, x minus 1. That way it gives me negative 6 when I multiply, and then 6 minus 1, positive 5x. So I have two critical numbers, I have x equals negative 6, I have x equals positive 1. So in part a, we're going from zero to nine. So we first look at negative six is not between zero and nine, but one is between zero and nine. So we're going to check f of zero, we're gonna look at f of nine, and we're gonna look at f of one. Notice once again, I am putting in the original function. So I have one third x cubed plus five halves of x squared minus six x plus nine. And we are checking those three points we talked about, f of zero, f of nine, and f of one. So we're checking the endpoint and the critical number for this interval. So we got nine, we got 500.5, and we got 5.83. We got nine, we have 400.5, and we have 5.83. So we look through, clearly the 400.5, this will be our absolute max. And then between the 9 and the 5.83, 5.83 is smaller, this is my absolute min. So I write 1, 5.83. Part B. We're still using the same critical numbers, negative 6 and 1, but our interval this time is negative 3 to positive 3. Negative 6 again does not fall within this region. 1 does, so we get to use the 1. So we're going to have f of 1, we'll have f of negative 3, and we'll have f of positive 3. We already know f of 1, we did that last time, it is 5.83. So what we need to look at is negative 3 and positive 3. So for negative 3, I got 40.5. For positive 3, I got 22.5. So here's 40.5, and here's 22.5. Just like last time, we look for what's the biggest, what's the smallest. So 40.5 would be the biggest. So here's my absolute max. And this is at negative 3, 40.5. And then back to what's the smallest. Again, 5.83 is the smallest. So once more, this is my absolute min. This was 1 with 5.83. So one more for this problem. I have negative 10 to positive 8. This time, I check my critical numbers again. Negative 6 is between this interval. 1 is between this interval. So we're going to do f of negative 6, f of positive 1. Fit this in here somehow. I have f of negative 10 we need to do, and then I'll just put it right here, f of 8. So four numbers this time. The only one we know so far is the 5.83. So let's go look at negative 6, negative 10, and positive 8. Right, so we have f of negative 6, 
gives us 63. We have f of negative 10. That gives us negative 14.3. And our last one, which is f of 8, gives us 291.67. So let's write that back in. We have a positive 63. We already had our 5.83. We have negative 10 was negative 14.33. And then 8 was 291.67. So largest, that would be our f of 8. So this is our absolute max at 8, 291.67. And then the min, I have 63, 5.83 in this negative. So the negative 14.3 is my absolute min. So that was at negative 10, negative 14.33. So what this shows you over and over, part C, both of the extrema happened at endpoints, at negative 10 and positive 8. When we go back to B, well, one of the extrema happened at an endpoint at negative 3, but the other happened at a critical number. Same thing happened in A. We had one that happened at an endpoint and one that happened at a critical number. So it's important that you, it's important that you check both things as you're doing this work. So let's say, well, what if it wasn't completely a closed interval? What if we had maybe like an open interval, but not negative infinity to infinity? Look at this one just goes 0 to infinity. So we're going to have to do some more work here. We don't have endpoints to plug in. So let me show you what's going to happen. We're going to start the same way we're doing everything in here, is we take the derivative. So I'm going to rewrite f of x. Instead of x plus 9 over x, I'm going to make it x plus 9x to the negative 1. And we are going to take the derivative. So the derivative of x is 1. And then the 9x to the negative 1 becomes negative 9x to the negative 2. I want to set that equal to 0. So first I'm going to rewrite that as 1 minus 9 over x squared. Then I can say 1 minus 9 over x squared equals 0. Well, we know ahead of time, x is not 0. So we're going to get to do a little bit of trickery here that we couldn't do if 0 is in the domain. So I'm going to say 1 is equal to 9 over x squared. And I can bring the x squared over and make it 9. I can only do that because x was never going to be 0. I can't multiply by it um, in the same way. If x could be 0, I could be throwing something away. But so here, x squared is equal to 9. I'm going to take the square root of both sides. And I'm going to get x is plus or minus 3. So I have these two critical numbers that we need to think about. But remember, we have a beginning domain. So that beginning domain says only use positive. So from this plus or minus 3, I'm only going to keep my critical number of x equals 3. So I have 1 instead of 2. So that's important. Now I need to decide what am I going to do with that? How am I going to tell if this is a max or a min? And you have a couple choices. So you could do the first derivative test and see if it increased, decreased. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and go to the second derivative. So our first derivative said we had 1 minus 9x to the negative 2. The second derivative, the 1 goes away. Derivative is 0. Negative 2 times negative 9 becomes 18. This is x to the negative 3 which is 18 over x cubed. So what I'm going to do is think about the concavity of that. Well, this concavity, let's put in the 3. I get 18. I get 3 cubed. This is positive. So there's not a time where this will be changing. The concavity isn't going to change from 0 to infinity. 18 um, over x cubed is always going to be positive because all of the numbers are positive. So what does positive mean for concavity? Well, that means it goes up. What do we know about up? Well, up says if we have a critical number in a concave up domain or interval, then that would be a minimum. So now I can see this is a minimum. I can also see there's only going to be one minimum in here because our concavity is not changing. We don't have any other critical numbers. So without doing more work, I can say, oh, this is the absolute min. I really do need a point, though. So let's go back and throw in 3. I have 3 plus 9 over 3. This is 3 plus 3, which is 6. So my absolute min is at the point x is 3, y is 6. 
The next one says find the absolute max of f of x equals 2 over x squared plus 3 and notice no interval is given. So we're going to have to think about that as we're doing it. But we know we need to find the derivative. There's no x in the numerator which says let's just make this a chain rule problem. So I'm going to write this as 2 x squared plus 3 to the negative 1. So I take the derivative, I get negative 2 x squared plus 3 to the negative 2 power. So the negative 1 came down, I subtract 1, negative 2. Don't forget to go back inside and take the derivative, which is 2x. Let's kind of rewrite that. 2x times negative 2 is negative 4x. x squared plus 3, this is squared, and the denominator. Okay. So what do I look at here? I look at when is this equal to 0? Well, this will be equal to 0 when the numerator, negative 4x is 0 which is just x equals 0. This particular denominator, x squared plus 3, to begin with, was never going to be equal to 0. I squared a number, I added 3, I know it's always going to be positive, so I don't have to worry about places where f of x is undefined, I don't have to worry about the denominator from the derivative, I just have this one little point from x equals 0. So last time I said, let's do the second derivative. This time, I really don't want to. This derivative would be the quotient rule. It might get a little sticky. So instead, let's stick with the first derivative here. So I only have this one little critical number that'll break up my domain, negative infinity to infinity. So we'll go negative infinity to 0, and then 0 to infinity. And I'm just going to pick a test point. Let's do negative 1 and 1. I'm going to put that test point into the derivative, which was negative 4x over x squared plus 3 squared. Again, it's really nice this bottom x squared plus 3 squared is always going to be positive, so we really don't have to think about it. We took a number, we squared it, we added 3, it got bigger, then we squared it again, positive on the bottom. So we just have to look at the numerator. Negative 4 times negative 1, positive. 1 times negative 4, negative. So I have plus, minus. This is increasing, this is decreasing. So if it goes up and then it goes down, this creates a maximum. So I know that this is a max when x equals 0. Let's plug in 0. We have 2 over 0 squared plus 3, which is 2 over 3. So my graph only changes once from increasing to decreasing. So I don't have to worry about another point being higher than this point. This is the highest it's ever going to get for the whole function. So I can say that 0, 2 over 3 is the absolute max. So let's try another one. This is f of x is 20 minus 4x minus 250 over x squared. Again, I gave a restriction 0 to infinity and I said I'm looking for an absolute minima. So pay attention that sometimes you're not looking for both, you're looking for a particular one. I'm only guaranteed to have both an absolute max and absolute min when I give you a closed interval. So if I don't give a closed interval, watch for me to ask for something specific. All right, so just like the last one, my first step is going to be rewrite it. So this is 20 minus 4x minus 250 x to the negative 2. Just rewriting so I can use the power rule. The derivative, 20 derivative is 0, negative 4x becomes negative 4. The negative 2 comes down, so negative 2 times negative 250 is 500. This is x to the negative 3. So what do we want to do? We want to set that equal to 0. So negative 4 plus 500 over, let's call it x cubed, equals 0 says that, right, so let's move that 500 over x cubed over. So I have negative 4 equals negative 500 over x cubed. Since they're both negative, I'm going to make them positive. I'm going to bring the x cubed over. So I have 4 times x cubed is 500. Divide by 4, x cubed is going to be 125, and then I take the cube root, and I get x is 5. So this is my singular critical number for this problem. So now I have to decide what do I want to do. Do I want to do a first derivative test, or would I like to do second derivative? Well, this time, the first derivative was pretty nice. So let's just go ahead and do the second derivative. Second derivative, the negative 4 goes away. 
negative 3 times 500 is negative 1500. I have x to the negative 4. So let's look at plugging that 5 in. If I do f double prime of 5, I have negative 1500 over 5 to the power 4. Now you can bother going through and finding this number, but really you just need to know the sign. So if you look at the numerator, it's negative. The denominator is positive. Together that's negative. What does negative mean? Well, negative means concave down. Concave down says this. It says I have a maximum, right? And that maximum will happen at 5. And if you wanted to know it, you would plug the 5 back in. And you would have 20 minus 4 times 5 minus 250 over 5 squared. This would turn out to be negative 10. But go back to what the problem said. It said find the absolute minimum. So the absolute minimum for this question, there's no absolute min. There is an absolute max that would happen at 5, negative 10. So watch the wording. I know sometimes it feels tricky, but it is just checking if something is there or not. And in this case, there is no absolute min. So I feel like we should do a few more, maybe add some more interesting things in there. So let's try finding the absolute max over the interval 0 to infinity of f of x equals x to the fourth over e to the x. So this way we're putting an e or doing a quotient rule. So like always, we are going to start with the derivative. So we're going to start with e to the x low d high 4x cubed minus the high x to the fourth and then the derivative of the low e to the x and then I have the denominator squared. Luckily, there's an e to the x everywhere. So I have an e to the x in the left top, on the right top, and then on the bottom. So I can get rid of one of each. It's like factoring it out. Let's show that. I could take e to the x out. I have 4x cubed minus x to the fourth, and this e to the x, e to the x, I'll separate. So this cancels this. So here's my derivative. I have 4x cubed minus x to the fourth over e to the x. So I want to set that equal to 0, and I really just need to take the numerator, 4x cubed minus x to the fourth, set equal to 0. We know that e to the x is not ever going to be 0 anyway. So 4x cubed, x to the fourth, I can take an x cubed out. I have 4 minus x equals 0. Well, setting that equal to 0, I get x equals 0. I get x equals 4. Our original interval is open at 0, so this 0 is not there. I want to throw it away and say I only have one critical number to consider it all, which is x equals 4. So I'm back to what am I going to do? I know I need to do more work. I can do a first or a second derivative test. Um, again, this first derivative is kind of complicated. So doing a second derivative might take some work. So I'm just going to say, let's stick to the first derivative and test that. So we said one critical number is all we have to look at. And this is four. This really is open. So we have zero to four. And we have 4 to infinity because we have a restricted domain. We're going to pick a number in each interval. Let's say I pick 1, um, and then let's pick 5. So we're testing our derivative. Our derivative is 4x cubed minus x to the fourth over e to the x. Now, luckily, when I'm thinking about this numerator denominator, e to the x is positive. e to the x is positive for whatever thing I put in there. So I really have to look at the numerator. So if I plug in 1, I have 4 minus 1 is positive. If I plug in 5, so this would be 4 times 5 cubed minus 5 to the fourth. You could grab your calculator and put it in. Um, it's going to be negative. 5 to the fourth is going to be bigger than 4 times 5 cubed. So this is negative on top. So I have plus, I have minus, this goes up, this goes down, here's a maximum. Which, if you go back to what we are looking for, is exactly what we are hoping to find. So I know I have an absolute maximum when x is equal to 4. 
we need to find the y value and this time I'm gonna show you like exactly and then we'll do approximately so plugging back the 4 into our original and if we want to look at our original our original was x to the fourth over e to the x so we have 4 to the fourth over e to the fourth so exactly it would be 256 over e to the fourth and then approximately let's say grab your calculator and you're going to get 4.69 so my absolute max is going to be 4 4.69 all right so we did one with e let's do one with ln so let's say we look for the absolute min on the interval 0 to infinity of f of x equals 4x natural log of x minus 7x. So start with the derivative and notice here we have the product rule. We have two things being multiplied together. So the derivative, derivative of 4x is 4, keep the natural log of x. Then plus, I keep 4x, derivative of natural log is 1 over x. Then the negative 7x becomes negative 7. So let's see what we can do to simplify that. I have 4 natural log of x plus 4 4x, 4x times 1 over x is 4 minus 7. So this becomes 4 natural log of x minus 3. We want to take that 4 natural log of x minus 3, set it equal to 0. So that says 4 natural log of x is 3. Natural log of x is 3 over 4, and then we're going to raise both sides to the e. So e to the natural log of x, e to the 3 fourths, says x is e to the 3 fourths. And I'm going to leave it just like that. This is going to be my critical number, and I'm going to use it as we continue. So we get to that point where we're like, well, what do we want to do next? Do we want to do the first derivative test, or could we do second derivative? And I think this is a good case to do a second derivative. So let's do f double prime of x. So 4 ln of x becomes 4 over x, and then minus 3 goes away. So really nice, short little derivative. I need to plug in my critical number, so e to the 3 over 4. And notice it was positive, right? We know e to the 3 fourths is positive, so it was between 0 and infinity. So I have 4 over e to the 3 fourths. So what do we want to know there? We want to know, well, is this positive or is it negative? And for sure, it's positive. 4 is positive, e is positive. So both of these things together are positive. Positive says concave up. Concave up says, oh, good, there's a minimum there, and we asked for a minimum. So we're really close to being done with this one. The only thing we need to know is what is the y value? Like, what would we get? So again, I'm going to show you the long way. So remember, our f of x was 4x natural log of x minus 7x. So if I want the exact value, we're putting in e to the 3 fourths. So I have 4 e to the 3 fourths natural log of e to the 3 fourths minus 7 e to the 3 fourths. All right, let's simplify that. 4 e to the 3 fourths, nothing to do there. But remember natural log and e inverses, so they go away and I just bring the 3 fourths down. Okay, then I still have minus 7 e to the 3 fourths. Well, I could cancel this 4 and this 4. So I still have the e to the 3 fourths, and I can bring this 3 in front, minus 7 e to the 3 fourths. So now they're the same, right? They're both e to the 3 fourths. 7 minus 3, this would be negative 4 e to the 3 fourths. So this is if I want the exact value of the absolute minimum. So we remember our x value was e to the 3 fourths, and then our y value is negative 4 e to the 3 fourths. This is my absolute min. Of course, you could put that into the calculator to get an approximate value, but I wanted to show you exact. So I have one more. Um, the last one I want to do is let's find the absolute max on the interval 0 to infinity of f of x is the natural log of x e to the negative x. 
So before we start, let's rewrite this. Remember that we can take um, a product when it's a natural log and express it as um, addition. So we're going to say this is natural log of x plus natural log of e to the negative x. Well, natural log of x looks good. Natural log of e to the negative x just becomes negative x. So we've been able to make this function much nicer by just doing a little bit of algebra there. So here's my function. So I'm going to take the derivative. Natural log of x is 1 over x. Of The derivative of negative x is negative 1. So I say 1 over x minus 1 equals 0. 1 over x equals 1, which just says x equals 1. I look for this 1. It's between 0 and infinity, so that says good. That's my critical number. And we're back to that choice. Do we want to take the second derivative? Do we want to do a first derivative test? Well, I can quickly rewrite the derivative as x to the negative 1 minus 1 and say, well, that looks pretty good for doing the second derivative. The negative comes down, so I have negative 1 x to the negative 2. The negative 1 derivative is 0, so I have negative 1 over x squared. So let's plug in our 1. We get negative 1 over 1 squared which is negative, so negative says um, concave down, concave down says we have a max, which is what we were looking for. So all we need to do now is find the y value, so we're going to go back and plug in our 1 into ln of 1 e to the negative 1. So this really becomes natural log of e to the negative 1, that's negative 1. So we have this nice little answer of 1 negative 1 as our absolute max. All right, so I hope that was an easy one. What I want you to remember as you're doing this particular section is if it says absolute and you have a closed interval, you find the critical numbers, you look at your interval, see if your critical numbers are there, plug them all into the function, look for the highest and the lowest. If it's over an open interval or the domain isn't given, then we're back to our old ways of doing things where we're having to decide, do you want to do a first derivative test? Do you want to go to second derivative? and do what is easy. Don't make yourself do more work than you have to, right? Look at the function and let the function help you decide which one to do.